festival that they say uh, this is a huge, huge honor for me. I'm enormously grateful to Anil and all the people who worked with him to make this uh, wonderful festival and give me this honor. To the, um, uh, the PTA for hosting us here. Um, and uh, also uh, to all of you for coming out tonight and giving me such a wonderful welcome. I'm really quite overcome by the whole thing. And I'm not that easily overcome, Don. Uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, quite amazing to me. I want to start, though, by perhaps giving a bit of background about myself um, uh, in order to set this in context. You might have read of a statement which I gave about receiving this award. And um, what a point, a simple point I want to make is I have become well known because I worked for the BBC at a time when the BBC was particularly influential. In my work, I was enormously helped by Indian journalists all over India and by my colleague, Satish Jacob. Inevitably, as the main voice you heard, I'm the one who gets all the glory. But the glory it should be shared amongst uh, uh, lots of different journalists, and particularly my colleague, Satish Jacob. And what is our, what was our achievement? Well, the one achievement I hope we can justifiably claim that was that for many years we enjoyed the confidence of the Indian people, and that was a huge uh, uh, responsibility in a way, but also a huge joy to all of us. Actually, uh, here I am in a uh, lit fest, a literary lecture I'm giving you, um, but I'm not actually really a very literary man. Uh, I regard myself privately as a jobbing journalist, and uh, I think that's a very honourable profession. And all my books have been about journalism. And I remember once, you know, coming back from a lit fest in Colombo, in Gaul, in Sri Lanka, and I was in the front of a vehicle, and behind me there were a lot of literary, international literati stars. And when we got to Colombo Airport, I said to Kiran Desai, Kiran, you know, I feel quite out of place with all you people. I haven't been to all the different countries you've been to. Um, I haven't met all the famous people you met and you were talking about. And I haven't read uh, a lot of the books you were talking about. So Kiran said to me, she said, well, don't worry, she said, uh, we haven't read half the books which we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I felt it's a bit more comfortable there as a jobbing journalist rather than a literary man. But, now, but the title of my book, No Full Stops, has been a bit of a burden to me. Way because it's such a good title and I didn't choose it myself. <laughs> such a good title that no one can remember the title of any other book than that, <laughs> which is a bit alarming from the publisher's point of view. And I had a wonderful problem with the title in Pakistan because I was doing a railway film, a great railway journey from Karachi to the Kaiba. <laughs> and as I was walking down the corridor, walking down the carriages, talking to passengers, I came across a guy who re recognized me and he said, you are Max Tally. So I said, well, no, I'm not Tally. He said, I'm reading your book. So I said, well, that's great. I'm delighted. Then he said, uh, you have no reason to be delighted. And I said, why not? He said, it's a pirated copy. Oh. <laughs> and then, then he ended by saying, now you have to do no punctuation marks in Pakistan. <laughs> well, sadly, Pakistan thinks I have become uh, so Indian uh, that they, so far, ever since I left the BBC, 
they'd never given me a visa, so I haven't written that book. <laughs> but what does no from stops uh, mean to me? Well, it means really the aspects of Indian culture as I see them, which have influenced me most. And really about these aspects that I've written in all my other books as well. And it's what I feel India should stand for. And here are some ideas for you. One is, you never write finish. That is the end of the argument. There is an uh, inevitably an uncertainty of certainties. You should always be suspicious of certainties. In fact, uh, I so emphasized that in one book that um, a great friend of mine said, you have made the uncertainty of certainty a certainty. <laughs> um, the limits of rationality, the understanding that there are other ways of perceiving. Uh, we had a wonderful lecture by Ian McGregor at the start of this festival in which he pointed out how we learn from things, and how we understand people from things, how we understand history from things. And of course, we learn from our emotions, emotions, we learn from all sorts of things which we cannot really describe rationally, and we cannot put into words. And I always quote the example of music, because music is something so wonderful. But can you ever actually describe the wonder of it? Yes, you can describe it in poetry, perhaps. Uh, you can just try and write down how you feel. But nothing can actually really put down exactly in words what music means to you, what music uh, does for you. I have learned, you know, from India uh, several things. And I described them in India's unending journey. When I said I have learned to value humility, to avoid thinking in black and white, to be suspicious of certainty, to travel the middle road, and to encourage there are, uh, not to encourage, but to acknowledge that there are many ways to God. And I've discovered uh, in India that God can act in strange ways too. I remember uh, an incident where I came to a full stop on the railway journey at Mogulsarai Junction, and I refused to change the name of Mogulsarai Junction. Um, and we arrived at Mogulsarai Junction in the middle of a very complicated journey to Panna. It was the first change. And I went up to the inquiry desk and said, where is the train to Varanasi? which was the next stage. And the man said, the train um, is, uh, we don't know, the train is indefinitely delayed. So I said to him in Hindi, so is the Kimatlanya, have you trained Kaipoja? And he said, ah, Kaipoja. Then I exploded um, as uh, uh, we um, uh, outsiders sometimes tend to do when faced with uh, uh, the uh, the Indian bureaucracy. So um, I said to him, well, what do you mean? What, what do I do now? And he said to me, calm down. He said, this is India, and uh, nothing ever is turns out to be disastrous because we believe in God. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, for God's sake, what the hell are you talking about? And he said to me, echo uh, gali so I set off in that train and reached Karnasi. No Footstops, therefore, um, was a book which was criticizing the colonial hangover of the elite in India. Near used uh, brown sarps, and of course it was written what, well over 20 years ago. And in that book, uh, there was a call for India to look to its traditional wisdom, mm -hmm. to take pride in that wisdom. The Western uh, uh, Karan Tapa um, interviewed me for that book, 
And Karantapa said to me, Yogo is taking us back to a golden era which never existed. And you seem to be suggesting that we should all be wearing dotage, we should all be sitting cross-legged down the floor, um, and we should all be, uh, as I said, going back to the golden age. So I put it very succinctly. I said to him, Karan, that is not what I want at all. But let's look to the future. And do you want to have a lucky America or an Asli Bharat? And I think everything I have written about is in some way being phrased, uh, being phrased in that context, contrast between Asli Bharat and a lucky America. And of course, America is not, uh, is in a way a short term for what I would call the Western way of life. And I believe that uh, India needs to, I still believe that India needs to find its own way ahead. And when I talked about Asli Bharat, as you will find out, I'm not talking about the BJP or the RSS way as that Asli Bharat. And I think it's important to make that point. When um, uh, recently I was reading Gurcharan Das's The Difficulty of Being Good um, with the subtitle of it on the subtle art of Dharma, um, uh, uh, Gurcharan said that Dharma was untranslatable. And of course, Dharma is in a way the basis of all morality, and yet it's untranslatable i.e. that means there can be no full stops to the discussion of Dharma and no one saying this is absolutely the right way or absolutely the wrong way to do something. <laughs> Dharma refers according to the Guru to balance, both moral balance and cosmic balance. It is the order and balance within each human being which is also reflected in the order of the cosmos. And I think that's an important point, because with Dharma, we are not just talking about individuals, we're talking about the cosmos, the universe. But we, I think, have tended to live in this century in particular, our personal lives and as, a, as our society in an unbalanced way. We've had a tendency to swing from one extreme to another extreme, rather than searching for the middle road. And to illustrate this, I'm going to talk very briefly about economics, politics, religion, history, and ecology. Let's take economics. There has been a swing in my lifetime from socialism to an extreme form of market capitalism. Where did socialism go wrong? Socialism went wrong because we, in a sense, assumed certain certainties. We didn't notice, therefore, what was going wrong. We didn't notice that we needed to get things balanced. And therefore, governments got too powerful, governments interfered too much, Trade unions got too powerful, and socialism became um, discredited. And then, as you see now, market capitalism has led to an enormous financial crisis in 2008. Looks as though it may lead to another crisis, quite likely, uh, not too long away, and has simply not delivered for large sections of the population which is, of course, hugely important uh, in a country like India. And it's very interesting that Francis Fukuyama, who wrote of Western liberal democracy as possibly the end point of mankind's ideological evolution, the final form of human government, he now says, if we mean by socialism, by redistributive programs, that try to redress the big imbalance in both incomes and wealth that had emerged, yet yes, 
I think not only can it come back, it ought to come back. And he also said, the set of ideas about the benefits of unregulated markets has in many ways been a disastrous, if they had a disastrous effect. Now, if we had been looking for balance, if we had realized the dangers and the possibility of swinging too far the other way from socialism, then this might not have happened. And indeed, I think we could say that Nehru's mixed economy might have been the way ahead for India if it had not been derailed by unbalanced socialism brought in by his daughter, Indira Gandhi. So India now, you might consider, is a balanced economy because we have a market economy and we have um, uh, socialist welfare measures too. In some way, that is true. And we had uh, uh, the great socialist achievements of the 2002 government, uh, which Abuna Roy was very much involved in, I think particularly on Nanrega and the various rights issues. But the basic problem with socialism this country, uh, or the socialist element in the economy in this country, is that too much of it is uh, just simple old-fashioned controls uh, implemented by bureaucrats and misused by politicians. And there's an article in the Times of India today which points out the problems being created by what would appear to be uh, a very laudable thing, fixed or official prices, in particular official prices for medicine. So again, if we want to bring these things together, uh, uh, socialism and uh, 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 market economics, and find a middle way in between, we have to be very careful of what we are introducing into the mix. And in particular, we have to be careful of the amount of bureaucratic and government control which we allow in bringing in the social and socialist element. And what is actually happening in India? Well, I think I, we can safely say that it is unbalanced. Because basically, India is health, going health or scalper straight down the road to try to aim for the sort of life lived in Western countries now. But Martin Wolf um, recently said, and Martin is perhaps the most prospective uh, journalist commentator on the economy. Martin Wolf has said, it is infeasible for India to imitate the path of the developed well, West. And the book he was, uh, he was recommending was written by a friend of mine, Ram Gopal Agarwal, a distinguished economist. And in that book he said, old roads used by the West or East Asia are now dead ends. India would have to design its own road, grounded in its socio-economic <laughs> political reality. So what's happening now, if you look at your television set, if you look at uh, uh, the advertisements anywhere, what we see is India is blindly following, in particular, in blindly following the consumerist way, the form of capitalism, uh, way in which consumerism is the energy of growth. But the trouble with consumerism is that consumerism is basically based on greed. Because if you are not greedy for the goods uh, which are being offered, uh, then you will not uh, want to buy them. So quite simply, consumerism is a uh, form of encouraging greed. Now interesting, look at the three uh, pursuits which are meant to dominate the life of a person in classical Hinduism. One is Adi, which is economic welfare, karma, which is pleasure, including erotic 
but and dharma which I have already talked about. Now look at the place of art in that. It is only one of two other things. And every book I've read of it says it is not a signal to be greedy. It's not a signal to uh, uh, devote your life to the pursuit of uh, uh, economic growth, your personal economic growth, or riches. It is not in any sense an encouragement to consumerism. Taking the three together, why? Because the art is to keep the three in balance. But how many people think of righteousness uh, when they go on a shopping spree? I don't think any of them very often is likely to do so. Then the environment, again. The imbalance in the uh, environment comes again from our unbalanced way of looking at nature and looking at the powers we exercise over nature. We fail to realize, God Tagore said so well, that we are part of one great whole. And that's why we've treated uh, nature in the way that we have done. Treated is actually the wrong word. We have abused nature in the way that we have done. Simply because we have uh, realized that we have power over nature and we have thought that that authorizes us to use that power as we would want to. Now, even uh, the Roman Catholic Church has come to realize very forcibly that the traditional Christian tradition that because of the first books of Genesis, uh, we are said to have control over the earth. Therefore, we, are, are, we can dominate the earth. Pope Francis himself has very strongly uh, criticized it. And he has said, we must forcefully reject the idea that we have absolute dominion over other creatures. And again, this is a question of balance, because yes, of course, um, we have in some ways to realize that by our, the way we are born, the way we've been placed in nature, we do have to exercise an element of control sometimes. But we always have to bear in mind, balance this by the fact that remembering the fact that we are part of one great whole. And here again, this is something which is essentially India, but I think again, by the way we treat the countryside, by the way at this very moment, we are ripping up all sorts of, all parts of, many parts of the country to build these roads. We have to realize the Indian tradition that we are part of one great whole, and if we hurt nature, we hurt ourselves. The problem, according to uh, Sunita Narayan, the director of the Central Science and Environment, is that she puts it quite simply, everyone wants to be in America. So if it were possible to attain such a lifestyle and yet combat climate change, our concern would be unfounded. But that is not possible. So again, there has to be a reversion to India's own traditional attitude to nature. And then what about politics and religion? Well, I would say there has been a swing from what I describe as the arid secularism of Congress to the extreme religious view of Hindutva. Now, why do I call the Congress a uh, secularism arid? Because although Congress people are, uh, frequently try to argue that they were aware of the place of religion, uh, actually secularism as a word tends automatically to be come to mean either dislike, distaste for religion, or at the very least. 
and wanting to keep religion entirely in the private sector. But even if that was a desirable idealism, ideal, particularly in a multi-religious and deeply religious country like India, I don't believe that that can ever work. And of course now we have the spectacle of Rahul Gandhi, temple going, and uh, uh, about uh, saying that the Congress Party is a party of Hindus, but not of Hindutva, trying in a way to catch up. Well, in some ways I applaud it, because in some ways I think it's a recognition of a reality that in the Indian polity, in Indian politics, you have to find a place for Hindus. But at the same time, I think it's all too easy to dismiss it uh, as a tamasha or as a desperate trying to give uh, the impression of believing in something that perhaps you don't. But the real uh, essence, the real Hinduism, which should be uh, part of our politics, part of our religion, and it should be shown to the world as the way to do things, is the Hinduism of Radha Krishna, our first, uh, the first uh, private president of India, who said there has never been a uniform, stable, unalterable Hinduism, whether in belief or in practice. <coughs> Hinduism is a movement, not a position, a process, not a result, a growing tradition, not a fixed revelation. And R.C. Zena, who, uh, funnily enough, held the same chair as Dr. Radhakrishnan in Oxford after Radhakrishnan left. And he said, Hinduism has a genius for absorption and adaption, for dogmatic certainty that has wrapped the religions of Semitic origin. They feel nothing but shocked in comprehension. And of course, what is happening, what the problem with Hindutva is it is basically a form of Hinduism which has dogmatic, is presented as dogmatic certainties. And this is not surprising because after all it is based on a movement which tries to imitate the uh, Semitic tradition in order to combat the spread of that tradition in the form of uh, Christian uh, missionary activity. So what we have then in, in religion and in politics, I think, is in, as in so many other things I've talked about, a need to find the genius of this country, a need to uh, realize that the way we, and indeed I think the whole world, uh, uh, progressing is going to lead to a dead end. Unless we recover these principles of uh, basically the ones which I've talked about right at the start, really the tradition of seeking balance, of being open-minded, of understanding that uh, whatever position we are in, we need to examine it because there are no full stops to any position which we might hold. And if you look at history, it is a history of change and of progress. It is not a history, as we sometimes see presented nowadays, of saying it is the, this is the end of history. And Francis Fukuyama has discovered this for himself. So, Perhaps I could just end with uh, one quotation, which actually comes from the last, from the introduction to Row Food Stops in India. And it's a quotation from the great 20th century British philosopher Michael Oakeshott. And he said, Those rich societies which retain in changing circumstances a lively sense of their own identity and continuity which are without hatred of their own experience, which makes them desire to efface it, are to be counted fortunate. Not because they possess what others lack, but because they have already opened 
mobilized what no one is without and all in fact rely on. And one more very short quotation from a ruler Roy, which I heard this morning, which I think sums it all up. She said, just said, everything today is monoculture. Today there is no diversity. But diversity is the law of nature. And diversity, in my view, is the underlying continuity which is given in your identity.